We have a limited time, so we're going to be incredibly efficient. Today, we're going to talk about conducting international education research, research and scholarship with many of my colleagues who have successfully done this. Next slide. So by the end of today, you should be able to articulate at least two reasons for engaging in international educational scholarship, describe common challenges when, pers when pursuing these and ways to overcome them, identify at least one example of scholarship in each of Boyer's forms, research, teaching, and application integration, and finally, identify at least one next step that you will take to engage in international educational scholarship after this session. Next slide. So welcome and introductions. I'm simply going to say that the people on this call are all amazing. I've had the opportunity and pleasure of working with them, sometimes even mentor them a little early in my career. And if you look into the chat room, you will see all of their names and academic titles. And I could go on forever about them, but in the interest of time, that's our introduction. We're gonna do our presentations and there's gonna be some small group discussion and then tips and we're gonna end with time for questions, answers, and of course a closing. Next slide. These are the people. Sophia is uh, at 2 a.m. time zone and dealing with COVID waves in Singapore. So she will be pre-recorded. Yep. This is my part. Um, so basically what, just to put it in, into historical context, I, I always try to, I like thinking about where I am in, in space and time and, uh, and, and you know, how, how these forces change over time. And so, you know, international health professions, education, scholarship, et cetera, it's nothing new. I mean, so even uh, before the enlightenment, before sort of modern science and medical education, I mean, we were learning from multiple civilizations, Hippocrates, Galen, Epicenter, all, all came from different uh, lineages and yet were used as like the books that people read to learn medicine, um, you know, before before there was actual scientific discovery. And then after the alignment, a famous example would be Osler, um, born in Canada, uh, educated in Germany, brought that to the United States and Johns Hopkins. Um, and then there are many other examples contemporary uh, today, contemporary, contemporary, contemporaneously, um, but where you know global health exchanges are a very popular thing. Uh, it's multiple visiting professors, and so this, this international knowledge exchange um, it has been going on for a long time and continues. The globalization is, is a little bit newer um, in in the sense that we, it is sort of one one world now. Um, it kind of started after World War One with the Health Organization and League of Nations, um, and then after World War Two, WHO was was founded. WFME uh, is for medical schools that focus on medical schools and they're in relationship with WHO. They're founded in 1972. Um, the globalization, I think, has taken a, a much harder turn from in medical schools with the ECFMG's new requirement that by 2024, everybody has to have graduated from a medical school that was, is accredited by an agency recognized by the WFME. Um, but that's kind of going to harmonize medical school standards across the world. Um, and ACG, in, in GME, it's a totally different scenario where um, ACGME, the US-based organization, uh, has ACGME I, and they're going into, they're accrediting programs within selected countries. Um, so that's kind of how globalization is panning out at that level. And it, there's sort of this harmonization and, and connection, but th there's also, you know, two other forces. So one is just the, the increase in just the volume of medical education period that's happening. I mean, so that this is the number of medical schools worldwide from 1900 up until around today. And, you know, it, it, it's followed a sort of J curve and, um, and is maybe, I don't, maybe it's doubling every, what, um, like 15, 20 years and, and potentially accelerating. Um, and, and then, you know, GME is, again, there are many more GME programs, subspecialties and GME programs are becoming more formal internationally. Um, and then, you know, even with this increase in number of institutions and programs, each of the programs is becoming more connected with each other, right? So this is a lot more, much more complexity. And this, this uh, picture illustrates um, one of the, the stronger partnerships that, that was funded by PEPFAR in the US. This is actually a 2012 illustration of um, African universities and United States universities uh, to, for, called Medical Education Partnership Initiative. And now it's become, I think, EPI and AfroHealth, and it's been sort of different generations nowadays, um, but you know, these, these connections are, and networks are, are, are growing in complexity and size. I mean, just to give you a framework for how to think about how, how much of a partnership you might be part of. So one would be stage one, I call it, is uh, 
just doing an educational program for an international audience. Um, but I guess I'm in the US, so technically Canada is international. So now we're, we're doing a little bit of like international workshop. Uh, stage two is more consulting and advisory, it's more longitudinal in nature. And the example here is University College of London has like a, a consultancy that it's set up um, and, and they charge for their services. Stage three would be like a, a formal partnership or, or collaboration. So the University of Toronto has a, an existing one with Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. And then, and then it's sort of like, uh, joint venture or ownership. And so, you know, an example would be well Cornell Medicine in Qatar and they have a, a campus that they, they really run. So here I'll let Dora take over. Okay, so I'll just uh, switch to focus or a shift a little bit and talk about where we are with international and multinational um, research output and, and then focus on medical education a little bit and, and why it matters. So this slide, it's a little older study from Nature looking at research publications from 20, I think 2001 to 2011. Um, and what I just wanted to point out is in the, in terms of the developed nations, which they consider the UK, United States and Switzerland, all of the recent publication increases in the last um, in the decade that they looked at had really come from, this is the light blue area, had really come from research from international collaboration versus domestic research, whereas the other nations are still growing their domestic research arm. Next slide, please. And of course, I think we have, we have seen this data um, that uh, there's an impact premium with uh, publications with authors representing multiple countries um, have a higher impact factor. And this is the UK and the US um, research publications and looking at it in 2001 and then 10 years later. Next slide. But despite these advances in international collaboration, uh, published international and multinational education studies are still limited and the medical education literature is really dominated by a few countries and primarily reflects a Western perspective. Um, next slide. This is a really nice review uh, <clears throat> looking at 50 years of publication in the field of medical education that was published in Medical Teacher. Um, but really what I wanted to point out is sort of the top right corner is that the top five, six journals publishing medical education research really come from US, England, um, and then one, one, one journal from Sweden. Next slide, please. Um, yep, thank you. Um, and then this, this study looks at not the site of the journal, but the origin of the publication. Um, and again, this shows that nearly 75% of medical education research publications originate from five countries, namely the United States, United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, and Germany. Um, again, showing how these are slanted. That's okay, next slide. Um, and this was interesting. This was in the same, um, in same study in medical education, looked at what the topics are um, in these studies. And so this is sort of the looking at um, diversity in publications in terms of what's published in low income studies. So not only uh, in low income countries, sorry. So not only is there an increased impact factor, but uh, looking at publications from these countries bring something to the table because they address different issues. And this would be a way to, to address medical, potentially address medical education research gaps. So I'll pick up now. Um, so that's the background. And now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, how to do international med ed research. Um, the reason why we're all speaking together is because we're actually in the international medical education research group. We've been working together uh, about over about 10 years now, hard to imagine, but about a decade ago, we met at a, at a medical education conference and since then have been collaborating. Dora was in Qatar at the time, Sophia was and still is in Singapore, and I was and still am in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, Joe was in the US, um, but was doing some international uh, teaching in, uh, in uh, some of our institutions, and Sean is a uh, recent addition to our team. 
Um, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the next few slides about uh, the kinds of studies you can do together. And you really can cover all the different types of uh, scholarship that Boyer spoke about or um, introduced back in uh, the early 90s. So next slide. So just looking at some of the studies and papers that we've done, one of our earlier studies, and now this is about, uh, I don't know, six or seven years old, we looked at with the, with the start of ACGME International and the globalization of US accreditation services in even the Royal College of Canada is now international. Some of the UK Royal Colleges have expanded internationally. Um, so accreditation is really coming from um, some of the Western countries to Eastern countries. So we wanted to look at the impact of that on clinician educators, on um, um, and on um, the uh, leaders of these institutions. So we did several um, studies in that realm. This is just one that we published about what uh, leaders and clinician educators felt about the, um, the transition to competency-based medical education and the impact of international accreditation. Next slide. Um, we then took a look at uh, specifically at uh, gender and in international academic medicine and how um, the globalization and internationalization of medical education was affecting uh, women educators uh, and whether their experiences were similar to those in the US and they were. Um, so based on some of our studies, we synthesized it and, and came up with the 12 tips on um, ways to promote gender equity in international academic medicine based on um, some of the responses we received from some of the women educators. Next. Um, and now Sean's gonna talk about some of the international work that he's done. Yep, so just a few other additional examples. So here's a, because a, a, a lot of my international stuff has not been done Internet, like in with, uh, uh, with me going abroad, it's been more staying at home and then executing uh, in international environments. So this was one where it was a survey that I, I did without uh, or worked on with others. Um, at Technion, which is Israel, um, Perdana, which is in Kuala Lumpur, and Peking Union Medical College, which is in China. And it was a survey at, of medical students at all three of those schools. And of those three, I I still have only ever been to Perdana University, um, never visited the others, but just kind of found other people who were interested in supporting this work, um, and then and then turned it into sort of a, a study that, yeah. So that was kind of a fun one, and uh, and then just a, a different type. And this is more scholarship of of application and thinking about WFME standards and applying a. a program evaluation logic model to the standards to see if it was possible. So this is a different kind of study. Um, and then and then just to round out Boyer's, uh, so the scholarship of integration, the, this is uh, the, uh, just a, a scoping review, which is more traditional in nature, but had an international topic where we're looking at um, the evidence base for accreditation of, of medical schools and identifying that there's been, at that time, there had been little research into it and it just kind of forms um, it had been formed mainly on tradition and, uh, and kind of what those in power liked and, and wanted to have happen. So, uh, so there we go. So we will not be doing breakout rooms. Um, you know, we've got, I think, uh, a one-to-one -one ratio of uh, presenter to participant. Um, but so I think, if, but we do have time, which is what we wanted to allow for for, for a workshop. So we wanted to, you know, maybe um, hopefully, hopefully hear from each of you uh, and we could even follow this format if you want, uh, take turns and, and share some things, or we can just not be quite so linear with it and you know just go with, go with the flow. So uh, when you want to speak up first. Well, I think it would be helpful if each of our uh, participants could just tell us a little bit uh, really about who they are and what they hope to get from the rest of the session and what kind of international work, if any, they have been doing and then we can get into maybe, you know, chairs, challenges and barriers. But I think since there's so few, it might be nice to sort of hear what they're most interested in. Um, I can start. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm a clinical hematologist and an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at uh, McMaster 
uh, in a clinician educator stream. And um, one of the one of the things, so so my uh, background training in terms of international re international relevance is that I did a, a master's in health professions education at uh, Maastricht University, which is in the Netherlands. So I uh, traveled internationally, at least for part of that degree. Uh, Maastricht University, as one of the slides uh, had highlighted, like in terms of the international collaborations, it has kind of satellite campuses, so to speak, uh, at uh, in BC and in London, Ontario. So there is a Canadian Netherlands connection there. Uh, I, I joined the program at the uh, home campus, which was which was in Maastricht itself. But um, the it was an interesting experience actually uh, getting having a master's thesis and research supervised uh, by a, a faculty member that was outside of my own institution and in a totally you know a very different um, environment. It was quite illuminating because uh, it's pretty easy to get pigeonholed with our own perspectives. I felt about how education is conducted in, in the health professions, and also came with a number of challenges um, collaborating with individuals from. It's a very international master's program, and even collaborating on coursework or research with um, individuals from all sorts of different time zones and institutions with their own norms and procedures, including ethics applications and so on, uh, was uh, challenging and time consuming to navigate. I'm very interested in hearing a little bit about how you as a group have navigated um, some of those challenges to collaboration and how you have maximized efficiencies to become as productive as you have been. Uh, I'm so impressed by the, the publications that you, you shared. And I, I, I can only imagine the amount of work and coordination that went into those, um, uh, it, it, you know, given that you're all from different institutions uh, across the world. We will get to that, but I think maybe it's best if we have the other people also introduce themselves. There may be some commonality in the challenge yeah. or, or the uh, thought. Laura, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, so I'm Laura Hazelton, and uh, I'm the co-director of faculty development for the Faculty of Medicine at Dell, but I'm also um, within the Department of Psychiatry. I'm a clinician, a psychiatrist, and also a director of education, but also um, deputy department head. And it's kind of with that hat on that I'm most interested because we have a new department head who just came last fall and he named me his deputy. And he's originally from Ghana. Um, he's a psychiatrist and he then went to Ireland and did training in Ireland. And then he went to Alberta, uh, which is another Canadian province um, and then came to Nova Scotia from there. So he's very interested in international collaborative initiatives and has done a lot of that type of work. Um, and one of his real, I guess, passions is trying to develop some education programs pertaining to um, psychiatry for international, like psychiatrists, I guess, in Africa, particularly. So um, we're going to be setting up a diploma in clinical psychiatry. Um, there's going to maybe eventually be a master's in psychi psychiatric health policy. You know, he, there's quite a few things he has in mind, but one thing that I hadn't thought about was whether there would be um, some opportunity for collaboration around education, psychiatric education, because it's all been sort of about either creating education or fellowship training, or it's been about like it's more CME, I would say, than faculty development. Um, but anyway, so this topic really interested me and um, just wouldn't even know where to get started to incorporate that into, but but lots of partnerships happening and ones that he's already more aware of. This is not an area I've ever been involved with, so. Okay, uh, Wendy? Oh, Wait, yeah, I, I gotta, I mean, Anthony has his hand up, so I feel oh, like I'm sorry, I didn't see that. I'm sorry, you're all in different parts of the Brady Bunch Square. No, that's okay, I just wanted to take my turn. No, I'm uh, Anthony Davis. I'm a community family physician here in Waterloo, and uh, I'm wrapping up my first year in the clinician educator uh, diploma program as a clinical teacher. So my interest in uh, 
the workshop is um, I have been involved in clinical work uh, in other countries and I've taken students um, uh, from McGill in 2014 to Kenya, Africa. He was actually doing a course, an undergraduate uh, course, uh, but I noticed even then that um, it was a challenge to kind of collaborate with a program like a home program when you're bringing in, you know, foreign uh, foreign expertise and technology, you know, without looking to be speaking down to people on the ground. And then there's always the expectation that you're bringing money funding. So I just wanted wanted to know how do you resolve those kind of issues? How do you choose what kind of contributions uh, the local partners will be making versus uh, their partners from uh, developed countries? Maybe now, Wendy. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, it's my great pleasure to attend this uh, program. And uh, um, I'm a physician from China. Actually, I'm a respirologist from China. And I came to master as a postdoctoral fellow, uh, actually 15 years ago. And I work um, for epidemiology study with Mark and Sears, uh, and uh, especially based on the asthma and uh, allergic diseases. And um, right now I have been here for 15 years. And uh, for myself uh, during my research, actually most of my work is related to research. And one of the basic, biggest uh, barrier for me to work here because I'm not able to practice as a clinician. And uh, because uh, our um, experience were not accepted in Canada. So, and this is why, because actually I also, because I work as the same research area as what I did in China. So this is also one of my biggest interest. So this is why I have to, I purchased this pathway until uh, now. And uh, actually I'm glad that I have made uh, many, several uh, great mentors. Uh, like Dr. Macron Sears and uh, uh, Peran Nair, and I also have some experience with him. And then later, uh, right now, I am um, work as a research associate and uh, to, uh, to be a liaison uh, of a collaboration between the Firestone Institute, because I work at the Firestone Institute, uh, between the Firestone Institute and the uh, this institute I worked in China before um, in the past 10 years. And the major role for me is uh, we try to induct, uh, conduct some international study uh, because uh, I think this is very important uh, to understand um, the, the disease, um, the, the prevalence and uh, the all mechanism in different area in the world. So I think uh, we can, because before uh, when I um, conducted study, international study in China is the one, uh, the first one is the uh, ISAC study, which is international study. And there are many center and uh, we are the first several center in China to attend and then also open our eyes and also when I came to Canada, and I also want to, to have this opportunity to continue to do some work. And so, uh, but just for myself, um, I think um, the barrier I just now I already mentioned uh, because I, I only can uh, do some work in the, the research, most of it is clinical research, um, but uh, we are not able to do some uh, kind of the uh, clinical related uh, because the license issue, uh, this is also very tough for us because especially when I came here as a newcomer and uh, I have to really focus on my research topic. And uh, also this is the uh, very struggle sometime. But right now, um, just uh, I have worked for in the past 10 years, continue to contribute to the, uh, try to facilitate the uh, collaboration between 
the uh, Fashion Institute and McMaster University in respiratory field with China partnership uh, a collaborator to see uh, what we can contribute more to conduct some more uh, good international study and uh, explore and try to also um, if, if we we already kind of the established a platform to see whether we can do further um, translational research. Yeah. So we're, we're obviously not going to be able to address legal issues and what institutions allow you and not to do, but maybe we can touch on some successes within clinical research. I know, Teresa, your, your Wi-Fi bandwidth is bad, so no video, but if you want to tell us briefly, you know, who you are and the like. No, I don't think she's. Uh... He may not even have a connection. At this hi, point. sorry, I'm just having trouble with connection. So, um, but yeah, hi, I'm uh, Tracy Chen. I know several of you, but um, I do a lot of research and education work, and I um, do a lot of it internationally. So I am, you know, have a big digital collaboration hub and things like that that allow us to. Um, publish papers without having to really meet and talk to each other much. We use a lot of asynchronous chat um, to conquer time zones and Google Docs and stuff like that, so. Great. So um, maybe we should just... Uh, oh, there's uh, just one more person. There's Wells or Greg who joined. So we should give him a chance. He has no, uh, no video either. Sorry about that, folks, but uh, I'm at Texas A&M University uh, in Texas, United States. Uh, I don't have a whole big footprint at the moment, uh, have really any footprint in the uh, international domain of health professions education. So that's why I'm glad to be here to get uh, oriented. Uh, the Some of the webinars from the uh, International Association of Medical Science Educators have touched on the, the uh, concerns but I'm um, glad to be here to uh, become more aware of, of the issues. Thanks for opening the session. Thanks. So uh, we'll just uh, start answering some of the questions one by one. And I think uh, uh, all of us speakers, like I said earlier, we're all part of a big international research group. So uh, I'm sure everyone will have some uh, stuff to add. So um, going back first to what Siraj was asking, basically about uh, we'll have we'll end the session with some things about challenges and how to get over the challenges. But one thing that I found that was very good in terms of being productive is finding topics that you're all interested about. So we were all in international settings working with accreditation at that time. So that sort of was the theme that brought us all together. How was this working for us and how were we doing it? And how was everyone else around us doing it? Because if you're dealing with a topic that you're not interested in or that just doesn't really excite you, it's going to be really hard to find the, the passion to do it. Um, Teresa brought up a great point. Um, we're in different countries and different time zones, but we are synchronous maybe for an hour a month. Otherwise, most of what we do is asynchronous. So um, with uh, good digital platforms and things like, you know, we use Dropbox a lot to share in Google Docs and things to share our um, our papers and to go back and forth. The beautiful thing about being on different time zones is when you're really trying to get a paper to the finish line, there's basically someone working on it at all hours of the day and night. So 24 seven. So sometimes as I'm going to sleep, those in the US will pick up on it. Um, by the time they, they're done at the end of the day, they wake up to a fresh new draft that I've been working on. So uh, you can sometimes use the, the time difference to your advantage. Uh, it really can help you, especially when deadlines, revision deadlines and things like that are looming. Um, uh, yeah. Does anyone want to address the, the, um, the question on bringing in local collaborators and how that works? I just want to take a, a 50,000 feet view. And a lot of the comments I hear relate to the fact that there are some challenges, but actually, whether it's local or international, I think the ways to solve them are just good practice. 
which is, as, as Hollis said, interest in the topic. The other is conversation up front. We were very explicit about who on the first paper would be first author and last author, what our expertise was, what our struggles were. When someone got called in to do extra COVID shifts, they let us know when we worked that out. That there is a lot to be said just by having an, a really, really, really hardworking team, right? Hala, Sophia, and Dora got the survey results by going to people and handing them out and basically badgering them until they, they return them. And the others don't give up. How many of our papers were rejected in the beginning? And we thought, oh my God. And now we have something like, I don't know, eight papers and four international workshops. You just got to keep with it. And that's true locally or internationally. The other big thing is to really make it a win-win. So this idea that you are collaborating is just that you and your local people are collaborating for what's beneficial to both. You're not going in and telling them what to do. They're not having you come in to like solve their need and do nothing. It's really like, what do we all need and how do we make this work? And then as Hollis said, there's asynchronous, there's synchronous, there's Google Docs, there's Zoom. Sometimes it's like early for me and way late for Sophia. And we make it, we just make it work because you really are dedicated. And then success begets success. You start getting papers published or you go to a meeting, they say, wow, this is great. It kind of excites you. I just wanted to piggyback a, a little bit on what Hala said. And I thought um, I thought about the question or the plans for, for Dr. Hazelton. And I think uh, initially we started, we had a common interest, but it was also based upon our daily work. We were all dealing with the ACGMEI accreditation process and that's where our research grew from. So I think for, for you, it's already given, you're developing programs, um, even if it's um, another branch where I was at Cutter was we also built our, our CME program for the health professionals. They were revamping their licensing and there was a number of publications and projects came out. We were doing that work and then we just sort of turned it into the process of doing it got turned into uh, scholarly work. So that's already there. That's helpful. Um, do I you have, well, I was just going to ask, her, do, you, do you have um, a reference you could send me? Um, for describing that, or should I just search your name? When, when you write up like the program development, do you have? Uh, so we have, I don't know, uh, I can send you, yeah, I can send you. I think a lot of it went into poster presentations and then I left, so I'm not sure where it went, but I can send you some of the things in terms of like curriculum development. Okay, yeah. that would be great, thank you. Do you need, you, you can find my email, I guess. Uh, I'll put it in the chat. Can, I'll yeah, put that would be great, that would be great. Um, and, the, and another uh, point about what Anthony was talking about in terms of bringing in local collaborators, exactly what Joe was saying about like be very explicit in the beginning and we just basically take turns like okay you are first author this person is you know a senior author and you know and give everyone in the beginning Joe was our senior author because 10 years ago he really is the one who sort of mentored us through it in the beginning um and uh now that he has his professor promotion he no longer is allowed to be senior author and we all sort of take that take turns now being first author and senior author and bringing it together but one of the good things about bringing in local people is i feel that there is a lot of room now with the globalization and internationalization of medical education which some would even say like the westernization of medical education global global there's a lot of room to look at um, how to bring that and localize it to your to your environment. So that's really where the local expertise comes in. I've been living in the UAE for now almost 15 years, but even you know people who are you know born and raised here and have been in medical education here for far longer than I have also can help us with that perspective. So there's um, there's a lot of opportunities to what we call glocalize what's, uh, what's happening and give it local, cult local relevance and local context. Um, and that's a really nice and not very hard way to bring in uh, maybe a junior local researcher who's interested in working with you on something. 
make sure your team has the elements it needs. I did some international teaching and I did a lot of research, particularly survey research around promotion and clinician educators, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't in any of these countries, but your team needs to have the expertise that it needs. And so you bring people together and make sure like with all good research, you don't hit the ground and start collecting questionnaires, but rather you think about your aims, you develop a questionnaire, you pilot it, you do the lit search, you do the good steps of research. Similarly, if you're developing a curriculum, you follow the six steps of curriculum development and you plan your assessment before you implement the curriculum. And when even with, so we talk about teaching, if you're teaching internationally, if you're adopting a new method of something that may seem very standard to you, and you're doing it internationally, that can also be a scholarship. So really think broadly about the things you do every day and then how you can convert them. And then know your institution. If you're at uh, McMaster and they have a clinician educator track, what do they require and expect you to do, which is gonna be very different than from the gentleman who was, I believe, from Texas. And then certainly extremely different than what's going to be expected at, for example, Johns Hopkins. So you really need to know your institution and why, you know, what you hope to accomplish by the research. So we have a few minutes left. I think we should shift back with uh, Sophia, who's in Singapore, and it's two in the morning for her. She recorded her uh, her part of the presentation, but I think. Um, I, are our emails on the um, on the poster or anything, or if there's a way we can share our emails, if there's more questions and you guys want to email us individually, then that's, uh, we're happy to respond offline. I, I don't think that your emails are posted on the uh, session page, at least the way I'm looking at it now. So if you'd like to share those by chat for those that are comfortable, that would be, I think, really uh, good. Sure. Fire away here. Hello again from Singapore, where I'm 12 hours ahead of those of you on the East Coast. I'll be taking you through the next section on tips for successful medical education research collaboration. From our collective experience, these are a mix of three elements to remember. First of all, that fundamentals of research still apply. Added to that, there are the layers of complexity for the research being international, and lastly, that this is an era of timely opportunities. Educational reform is occurring in many settings globally, and evaluative research is urgently needed to study outcomes and impact on the local health systems. Multinational collaborations can facilitate this, for example, by pooling and sharing of big data sets. Formal structures and resources put in place in international accreditation have also created new opportunities to find and connect with potential collaborators. For example, institutions and programs accredited by the ACGME International are listed online and most have created their own publicly accessible websites to host information and even contacts. The annual uh, ACGME Annual Education Conference also now includes an international track. And along this vein, with an increasing number of high quality HPE conferences internationally, there are now more opportunities to disseminate work and to network than ever before. Their current virtual and hybrid format can be especially attractive to first time participants who may want to dip their toes into the international med ed space. So how can you start today? Using fundamentals such as finer criteria, develop a feasible, interesting, novel, ethical research question, and aim to make your study relevant and aligned to the educational needs of the research team, as well as to the broader international academic medicine community a tall order. But international research collab collaborations are generally expected to have ethics board approval from each participating site, with ethics requirements varying from country to country. Often this results in significant delays, uh, and again, the added complexities of being international. Uh, we need to recognize that research protocols that ignore local norms or do not promote national research interest may not be approved despite regulatory compliance, so even if you check all the right boxes. You may also need to proactively educate your local board, especially if medical education research is novel in that particular setting, uh, where they may not even have an established board that looks after medical education research. Embrace technology, the usual suspects, group video conferencing, file sharing, and the like. 
but you'll need to ensure that all team members have access to and are comfortable with the specific platforms you select, as these may be blocked in certain jurisdictions or may not be the same as those that are commonly used in other countries. Related to this, be cognizant that not everyone will be comfortable voicing dissent in a group setting, especially when the setting is virtual and for collaborators not fluent in the domino language. Educational terminology can also really differ from country to country and miscommunication can occur even among English speaking collaborators. Now, what can you do long term? Plan across collective calendars, schedule team meetings while attending international conferences. You can solicit expert feedback on the team's work and find inspiration for new projects, present and disseminate your work to build the group's reputation on both local and international levels and network to build future collaborations. Beyond this, do take the rare opportunity of bonding face-to-face -face with your teammates whom you may not have seen in a very long time. Explore funding options available from all involved countries. These may include government grants, public granting agencies, private philanthropy and the like, uh, and may really vary from setting to setting, as well as uh, individual institution, uh, universities and hospitals where your teammates may be working. However, it's often necessary to collaborate without funding. So seek sustainable ways to pull the team's existing resources at your home institutions uh, such as who has access to a research ass assistant who can, uh, for example, coordinate all the IRB uh, submissions, um, regardless of country, or in who has access to statistical or reference manager software that has like and has licenses that can be shared across the others. Do use the collaboration as an opportunity for all team members to build capacity. Everyone should get a chance to advance their research skills and continue to a research agenda that is reflective of their own as well as their local educational interests. Consider these strategies that we found very successful. Rotate who leads calls or writes minutes, create smaller subcommittees for larger collaborations, distribute authorship responsibilities and rotate the leadership and the lead authorship of specific projects. Finally, pay it forward and you will be paid back. Once your team is established, consider adding junior researchers who will benefit from your expertise and resources. This is especially true for clinician educator researchers in international settings where formal CE academic tracks and recognition of scholarly activity may in fact be lacking. I will now pass the time back to my fellow facilitators who I know will be happy to take your questions. Yeah, I think we're at time to, um, but I think we're happy to stick around and discuss more. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zibrahim Tackett, Con Francesco Stadler, uh, for a really interesting presentation. Um, uh, we can keep this uh, room open for a little while longer in case there's other comments or questions from the group. Um, from 2.45 to 3 p.m. for this uh, afternoon, there is a break. And at 3 p.m., there is uh, a group session, uh, which is led by Ruth Chen and Yusuf Yilmaz called Introduction to Quest. Um, our facilitators have kindly included their email addresses uh, in the chat. And um, regarding Lara's question about the recording uh, for this uh, session, uh, I will get back to your group about uh, accessing the recording once it's cleaned up from our administrative staff. So, um, you know, uh, we'll be in touch about that. Uh, Laura, do you have something? Uh, go ahead. If people wouldn't mind staying on for a minute, I wouldn't mind picking people's brains. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I want to. Uh, what, what time does the next session start? At uh, three. Uh, three. Three p.m. Laura. Yeah. Okay, I'm in Atlantic Zone, so four my time. Um, okay. Yeah. So that's that's very helpful. Thank you. So, how would you even suggest that some that I start like? Um, is it like, I, I, is it your experience that, like, it sounds like you were all in different countries already. Is that true? So you found yeah. each other and then you collaborated with people you met maybe at a conference or something. Is that how you met? Okay. Yeah, and we then... met at, a, at an ACGME conference. So um, we we're all doing international GME. Right. So you were already people who were working in this space. And then- So you, you... We, we actually didn't, we met at the conference 
and then but didn't connect and talk about research there. It was months later um, when um, actually I reached out to, I found the conference brochure and reached out to Sophia and was like, hey, remember we met at the conference that I'm interested in doing that? And then we reached out to um, Dora. And then when I was doing the literature review, found out that Joe had already written a paper a while back about the topic we were interested in. So I had met him in a different venue. So it was really a, a matter of networking. Like you meet people and then it's just a matter of you know, reaching out and saying, would you be interested in doing this? Yeah. yeah. But the question is how to meet people, how to meet people? Like, well, I, I don't think it'll be hard to meet people. Um, but the question is meeting people who are in already have some interest and expertise in medical education, I think, is the part that I'm trying to get my head around. Um, so it's like all good research. How do you do it? You either go to meetings and network with people and you get to learn, oh, Dora is presenting. Let me check, email her after the meeting. Or yeah. you do a really good literature search in the topic you're specific, not med ed, because you get yeah. 18 million, right? But in terms of Hollis interest, it was clinician educator promotion. Right. Sort of, so that narrowed it down and sort of she and I connected. So. It's like anything else. How do you find people? You you figure out who the leaders are and who's interested. And sometimes you just email them and say, hey. Yeah. Well, maybe along those lines, are you folks looking for opportunities to collaborate or are you full up with collaboration? We're always looking for opportunities to collaborate. Every time we give one of these talks, is it an opportunity to meet people and, and collaborate on stuff? So um so, and if not us uh, specifically, you know, you meet people, it depends on, I may know someone who's interested in doing yeah. exactly what you're talking about, or, or uh, Dora has contacts at Cornell Qatar still, and Sophia's in Singapore and knows lots of people. Right. So there are, there will always be, and we are all in, in the med ed world. Yeah. So we can, um, yeah. we can find connections. International medical education is a small community. Is it? Is yeah, that. because the, this is sort of my challenge. Like, I mean, I have, you know, I have published before and, you know, been in group projects, but it's been more, um, like I'm trying to think, I guess some of them were people like I, I'm on the National AFMC Faculty Development Committee and, you know, one of the recent publications was from that. Um, another one that I was, that I met someone at, at leadership conference. So, so, but I just haven't met anybody who does this uh, international uh, and particularly, I guess, because I've done most of my work at the medical school, most of my scholarly work, it's not been specific to psychiatry, a lot of it. And so I'm also trying to think like, I mean, there is, you know, at the Association for Academic Psychiatry has an annual meeting, I guess that might be a place to try to connect with some people, but, um, yeah, like I can't even think who I would identify as a collaborator, um, although my department head probably does have people in mind, um, but then I, I still wonder how much they actually would know about medical education. Yeah, I think, um, um, medical education. I feel like I, my, my impression has been Canada's got a pretty close-knit group of like uh, um, professional, like medical educators, health professionals, educators. Does, and yeah. so, you know, with all the institutes, like Wilson Center and I am McGill and all these, you know, everybody's yeah. got one, I think. Um, and, and so like to just, I don't, I don't know what conferences they go to if they're already been going, but I think that's yeah. one place. And the other, other one you could put on your calendar if you, if you don't weren't aware of is Amy. You heard yes. of that conference? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've, I've had things presented at Amy that I was an author on. I've not been the, the lead author on them, but um, yeah, no, I, I mean, I guess maybe I'll try to just think, cause I, I, yeah, I, I certainly would know lots of, that's how I'm here today, partly, even though I'm in, Nova Scotia, you know, that's why I'm at an Ontario conference is, is through the um, AFMC Faculty Development Network, but I don't really know. And I mean, maybe Siraj, you're based in Canada. So maybe your perspective, like, are there a lot of Canadian education scholars who are working in this kind of area that I'm... So I'll echo one thing, which is to say that I find specialty specific medical mm -hmm. education collaborators are a little bit harder to come by because you're just narrowing the field a lot. Yeah. I'm in hematology and thromboembolism, and there are sometimes challenges about finding, you know, suitable collaborators for maybe med ed research questions relevant to your specialty. It's probably 
my experience easier to find collaborators to you know to look at um, topics that are transferable across different different specialties. Um, I don't you know the 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 connections that I formed are mostly local. I will say uh, um, outside of what I had gained from the master's program, which actually kind of that I, I did, which forces you to have those international relationships. Um, the majority of the other relationships or networking opportunities or, you know, fruitful collaborations have come from our educational, you know, research unit, which is uh, for our university is called Merit. I'm sure you have something, uh, the analogous institution at, uh, I believe it's Dalhousie that you're at, correct? Um, so I don't, I personally don't have a lot of expertise seeking out new international uh, and, and, um, collaborative relationships outside of outside of my graduate studies. Um, but I, I will say, with, speaking to Sean's point, that my perception is that um, that at our Canadian Medical Education Conference is that if one were to approach people about collaborations sure. across different yeah. centers, that they'd be very willing. It seems to be a very collaborative uh, uh, environment and group of people across the different Canadian universities in my limited experience. It may just be that I've not really, because I wasn't really interested in this area until recently, I probably haven't, yeah, as you say, sort of attended those sessions at conferences. I probably wouldn't have attended this session, honestly, a year ago, because this wasn't my, you know, area I was thinking about. Uh, another another thing you could try is like looking at the editorial board of like academic psychiatry and seeing, you know, um, what- if people you know, in other countries. Yeah, what's what there, or if you, even if you recognize one person on the board, like they'll, they'll get submissions from other countries, they may be familiar with international researchers, they may have, you know, some connections. So it's really trying to like, dig into your network and, and, and opening yourself and, you know, and, and it's, it's much easier to have someone connect you rather than getting because i know when i get random emails from people saying hey do you want to collaborate i'm like i don't know who this person is yes. so you know um unless it's someone makes that connection but it's again if you ask around enough you'll meet people you'll meet you'll meet people who know people who know people and you and it's it's uh, it'll take a little bit of work, but once you meet one or two people, then the world really does expand. Mm -hmm. Alice has had her hand up for a bit. Hi, hi everyone. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the great presentation and discussion. Um, yeah, um, I'm new to this. I, I just recently graduated from my uh, master. Um, HPTE, and um, I'm actually very interested in um, international medical education. And um, just wondering if you guys know any groups that are currently existing that, because um, my topic is about concussion, like teaching like family medicine. Do you, do, like, do you guys know anyone to maybe potentially um, who are interested in teaching family medicine like internationally or something? I think it would depend on the context, um, you know, and, and like, I, I guess, what do you, you, you teach family medicine in like clin clinical family medicine or what? Um, I teach concussion. Concussion? Yeah. Okay. And what about concussion? Um, basically, it's like, um, like this concussion curriculum that I created, but I want to, you know, like looking for ways I can collaborate with like you know people internationally to um, to further develop this curriculum. Um, right now I'm doing this curriculum for like family medicine. Okay, yeah, I mean I think that's a that's a different. Well, it's it's it is it's dissemination. It's international medical education. It's a lot, it's a lot of what we talked about right? is like what it what is it exactly like? What is international medical education? What do you even mean? Um, but I, I would I don't know anybody personally, but I I, I think the my suggestion would be to, to as we've said to kind of reach out to an expert and just let them know that it's out there. Now uh, and you know I think maybe Hala said don't email, but I, I think I, I would I email people all the time. I, I'll email uh, like I'll read an author's paper and I'll look at the corresponding author and I write them and say hey I really like what you did here what you said and I you know I, I noticed it and can, can we talk for thirty minutes about whatever you know and I, I mean not not whatever but like I, you know I. I I'm specific in what I what I'm requesting time for, and almost people almost always say yes to that. 
I mean, then the rare occasion where I've got an email from somebody uh, that they've noticed my work, like, and if they want to talk, like, I'm happy to talk. You know, like, it doesn't cost me much, like, to, to spend 30 minutes or an hour with somebody just, like, picking my brain. It doesn't have to go anywhere beyond just, like, an informational, you know, and then maybe here's three or four names or here's three or four things you should read or whatever. And, and then it just kind of goes from there if you do it often enough, you know. Um, but I, I would suggest that, yeah, don't, don't be too shy about just being thoughtful and politely letting people know. Or, or asking for, for some of their time. And I find that the family medicine journals are actually a little more international than some of the other specialty journals. So if you look at the journals, you will you could find um, uh, international authors who may not be exactly in that in that you know that specific curriculum, but related things where you can reach out to them. Thank you. Um, adding to the point about cold emailing people, I remember a conversation I had with Teresa who pointed out that the pandemic is a great opportunity because it allows you an excuse to Zoom call people where we didn't really have that as a norm, uh, you know, some years ago. So the whole concept of a video conference was relatively foreign to people or not commonly used. So um, it, perhaps a little bit more, more socially and academically acceptable now than it was pre-pandemic. Um, so I, I'm going to close the session now because uh, for those interested in attending the remainder of the conference, the next uh, session is starting at three o'clock. Thank you so much uh, to our panelists for a really nice discussion. It was really a pleasure meeting you all virtually. Thank you.